millions of people should have an exit ready business. Is your business exit ready? Probably not. Discover in this episode from Pete Moore how your business can become exit ready so you can save hundreds of hours of work. Pete Moore is the founder of Simplifying Entrepreneurship, and he helps business owners transform from operators to owners using a variety of frameworks that cut through the chaos and the overwhelm of running a business. As a certified exit planner and Colby coach, he has refined his tips, tools, and techniques over the past 30 years, sharing them to help others live the life they deserve as business leaders. The first question is, what's the secret to your success? And why is having an exit ready business important for your mental health and <laughs> your pocket. Welcome to Awakened Titans Podcast with Lily Patrashku. Mind blowing conversations with influential business titans sharing how you can manifest abundance, love, joy, success through quantum awakening, quantum manifestation, quantum healing, quantum miracles, exponential business growth, and innovative products and services. You know, uh, Lily, it's an interesting thing, and um, it, it's been a long road. You mentioned it, uh, 30 years now I've been in business, so it's not. it hasn't always been successful. We've had some pitfalls down the way. We've had some failures, but I think one of the things that I've had over the 30 years is an incredible amount of learning, learning through those mishaps, learning through the good times, and being able to share them with others, and I think that's you know sort of the, the journey that I've been on, and um, we are currently still, we still own a couple of shoe stores, so I'm still active in business, but majority of the time I'm spending uh, helping other people through their issues and their problems as a business coach and a speaker these days. And when we look at exit planning, which is one of the big things that I do, you know, whether you're new in business or whether you're getting towards the end or what you think might be the end of business, you should always be thinking about an exit plan. Exit planning is just good business strategy because one thing's for sure, one day down the road, whether that's one year from now, two years from now, 20 years from now, you will exit your business and you want to have your business in a state of readiness so that when you have to exit, it's ready to go and you're not leaving money on the table. And just think about this, Lily. About 50% of businesses exit because they want to exit with a planned exit strategy, and that's fantastic. But the other 50%, and I'm talking to you, the listener here right now, exits for reasons that they're not wanting to exit. And I'll use a couple of um, ones that cause a lot of business exits. One is death. If you die pre prematurely, is your business ready for that? One is divorce. Divorce causes a lot of business exits. A lot of, of business breakdowns happen because of divorce. Partnership disagreements. If you're in partnership with another person and they want out and you don't want out and all the different things that can happen within partnerships can cause early business exits. Disability. If you get into an accident, if something happens to you, whether you have cancer or whether you're, you're unable to work for a few months, is that going to be detrimental to your business? Sometimes to the point where your business is not even going to come back. Or things like distress like COVID that has you know happened over the last few years can cause a shift in how things happen. And your business needs to be exit ready all the time, not just three months from now, you're saying, oh, I think I'm going to sell my business and I'm hoping uh, we can you know make a million bucks. Thank you. Tell us some of your achievements, if you can, with stats and figures so that entrepreneurs can get the idea of why they should listen to you. Sure. Uh, well, I've had many, many businesses over my 30 years. Uh, we've owned franchise businesses. We uh, currently independent shoe stores. Uh, but, you know, I've 10 times businesses. One of the businesses we bought, it had, I was a cleaning company. And so I've ran many service businesses along the way too. But we bought it at 30 clients and we sold it at 300 clients. And another business, you know, we grew from me doing all the work in a bathroom renovation company to having five trucks out on the road and you know doing over a thousand bathrooms a year um that we were we were in in a given year and you know so these different things our shoe stores you know same sort of thing we've we've grown from just having the one store we had three we had one that didn't go so well we have two now but they continue to run and they run on their own and 
that's the thing that I do these days with most of my clients is I help them get out of the business and move from operators of their business where they're making every decision every day to what I call the ownership position where I'm only working about a day a week or so in my shoe stores. And the rest of the time I have to talk to great people like you and the listeners here today and to coach. And if you want a business like that, that runs on its own without you all the time, then that's why we're here having this conversation because that is an exit ready business. Thank you. Why is it so important to go from operator to owner in order to exit the business? Well, just think about the value. If you were looking at your business today with the lens of a buyer and saying, okay, well, I'm going to buy your business and, and now I'm get, I'm digging into the due diligence. So of course, they're going to look at the financials and they want to see that all of the financials are clear and it's profitable and there's no ambiguity there. But uh, after the financials, they're going to look and say, okay, well, is the owner the hub and spoke of this business? Is the owner making all the decisions? Are they the primary salesperson? Are they the primary contact for all the suppliers? Are they the primary contact for all the biggest customers? And if they are, that's a problem because when they leave the business, there's a lot of incurred value there that's leaving as well, right? So when we think about these different things and we lay them all out, it's really, really important to think about your business with a buyer's lens. And when you start doing that, you realize where some of the gaps are and that you're so involved that you need to get out of the operations and let other people start to take over for you to make sure that things happen without you. Because that's when the value of your business really increases a lot. Thank you. A lot of the value in the business is actually emotional. What I mean by that is that imagine I'm doing my hair with a particular hairdresser and then you know, uh, let's say I like Petra and all of a sudden Petra leaves, then I'm not so tied anymore to that company. I'm tied to Petra in particular. So I wonder how do you transfer that emotional value uh, so that you can build an exit ready business? Well, that, that is the thing. And it, it's a problem when it's only one or two people in a business because the business owner typically is the key person, which makes their business typically a lot less valuable. And, you know, it's a reality. So as your business grows, the idea is that you want to ensure that there are other people that are serving your customers without you and that relations, relationships are being built without you and that process is being done without your involvement. And all of those kind of things, because if it's just you and you are the name, it's it's Petra's hairstylist and Petra's the only chair there, then that's a hard business to sell. Um, but if you've got six chairs there and Petra's one of six, that's a lot easier to sell when you look at it from a valuation perspective. And that's the reality of small business, uh, Lily, is that when it's a, a micro business, like a one operator, it's typically tied to that one person. And the value is going to be a lot less than it is, is if you're growing your business. And that's one of the pillars of valuation is what's the growth potential for this particular business. And if it's a one chair salon, it's not that, it's not that big. So the valuation is going to represent that. Thank you. I was wondering actually, if let's say you have, um, you have a company that has, I don't know, 50 employees. Mm -hmm sell it technically you sell it with the employees right for sure how do you make sure that uh your company is exit ready in the sense that you're not demoralizing the employees so that they actually stay with the company and then they get sold altogether because that's part of the value it is you know when i i i have uh i wrote a book a while ago called the business owner breakthrough and you know quickly it, it's about the five p's and the five p's is understand your promise align your product your process and your people to it so that you can have the right amount of profit and in that people portion that we're just talking about here there's your ideal client there's your ideal teammates and there's your ideal suppliers and with your ideal teammates there it's about creating the culture in your business where they want to work in the business, they want to make the decisions in the business, they love what they do, and they want to see that through with or without you. And these are the pieces when you become, when you start to become the leader and the owner of the organization, as opposed to the operator of the organization where you still are making all the decisions. When you start to hand over and transfer, um, transfer power and accountability to your team, then they're going to want to stay providing the new owner has 
has that same sort of philosophy of growth. And a lot of times a new owner is going to bring in a whole bunch of new things and want to grow even more. And if those people like that idea, they're going to stay. But of course, as part of a business transfer, we can never guarantee that people are going to stay. That's just impossible. We can't, we can't tie somebody's hand to stay with through the ownership group, but you can give them the history and you can say, Hey, you know, here's the history of the 15 people or the hundred people that have been with me. These, this many has been with me five years. This many has been with me 10 years. And that's part of the due diligence process. The reality of it is, is that most of the people that work with you still will probably require to work. And they probably are going to be most comfortable working at what they've already been doing. So they probably will stay. Thank you. What are the steps for businesses to prepare for being exit ready? Well, one of the things that we do uh, on the exit, I've got a website and it's called the exit ready business.com. And there I have a, an assessment. It's called the value builder assessment. And going through the value builder assessment gives you eight key drivers. And those eight key drivers are the eight most important areas of your business that you need to work on. And it'll, you'll self-rate yourself. But at the same time, some of those you're going to be doing really well in. Some of them you're going to need to do some work on. And that's okay. Everybody's at a different spot in their journey. The idea here is if you don't understand from a benchmark where you're starting, it's very hard to understand what you need to do to make the improvements. Because being exit it ready takes some time like most businesses it this is a journey through a couple of years in order to get things in a really good shape where you feel very confident about having everything in order for an easy transition down the road whenever that may be thank you so tell us some of the elements we should be looking at when it comes to preparing your business to become exit ready well the big thing and we've talked a lot about it already is are you the person as the business owner where that everything has to go through. Do you do all the scheduling? Do you do the book work? Do you do the sales? Do you do the ordering? Do you do all of these different things? If you're the person that has to make the final decision on all these things, that has to change. And the way to change that is start with your process. Remember the five Ps, understand your promise, align your product, your process, and your people. Well, in order to get your people to do other things, you need to have really good process in place. And so if your process isn't documented, and for those of you that are watching the video here today, instead of just listening, if it's all in your head, you can see why I've pulled all my hair out already, because in earlier years, it was all in my head. But if it's all in your head, that's a problem because how can other people on your team get in your head to know what you're thinking in order to make a decision that's in the best interest of the business? And so we need to start with the lowest hanging fruit of uh, the process. And for example, if, we were, if you own a retail store, how is the store opened in the morning? Once you, t once you open that door, you turn on the light, you, open, you vacuum, you mop, you do all the different things, you get everything ready, you, get, you count the till, you, you know, all of those things. Are they checklisted? Are they documented? Are, are they all set and ready so that when the door opens for public and business that it's ready to go without you? And if it isn't, that's a problem. These kind of things, whether it's purchase order, whether it's a sales meeting, whether it's answering the phone, whether it's hiring the next employee, I haven't hired an employee probably in about six or seven years. The only people that I would hire are my top level managers and they've been with me for a long time. So thank goodness I don't, I haven't had to hire, but they hire all the people underneath them because that's the way our accountability structure works. Wow. That is so interesting. What other elements should entrepreneurs consider when preparing their business to be exit ready? So your process, for sure, we had talked about, um, but I think there are several other things. You know, do you have people cross-trained to do the work? If one of your key people leaves, what does that mean? And if one of, one of like, are, are there other people that can step in easily to take that on? What about the agreements that you have with your suppliers? So all of your suppliers that help you deliver the promise that you make to your clients, whatever that may be, whether it's hairdressing or whether it's selling shoes or whether it's, you know, uh, doing bathroom renovations, all of the different things that you do, are your supplier agreements firm and in place? And can they be transferred to the new owner? And if you have one supplier that's your majority supplier, that's a problem. You don't want to have any one supplier that's that's supplying you with maybe more than about 15% of your overall goods. If it's too segmented down into a large, like if you, if you have one supplier that gives you 80% of your supply for your business, 
what happens if the new owner has a bad relationship or they won't start that new owner out with the relationship because the relationship is with you? You lose all of the value of that supply chain. So we need to have supply chain. We need to have uh, employment and we need to have key customers all in place, no more than 10 or 15% of the business in each one of those situations will make a more valuable business down the road. So same thing with your customer. If you have one customer, that's 80% of your business. That's a problem, especially if you leave and you're the key person that's looking after that client. Thank you. If you are the man with the 100 hats that does so many stuff, so many things in your business, and at the moment, let's say it's working for you because you're keeping more profit, but you're putting in more time, what what can you do to make sure that you're not in the short term losing some of the profit? Well, there comes a ceiling, Lily. And I think that's usually when I get involved working with most people is they're at their ceiling. And the ceiling is, is I can't grow anymore because I can only make so many decisions. I'm already working 50, 60, 70 hours a week and I, I just can't do anymore. It's to the point where sometimes they say, I think, I think I'm just going to sell my business. And the reason they want to sell their business isn't because it isn't a good business. Usually it's because they don't know how to move from operator owner. They don't know how to bring on somebody else. They don't know how to set up process. They don't know how to do these sort of things. And, um, and it does cost money to have other people work with you and make decisions. And I think, you know, you, you come to the point where if, if they're actually doing what's really, what they're really good at, they're probably more efficient at it than you are. And you can go and do what you're really good at. I have an exercise called love it or leave it that I put most of my clients through. And the idea here is that there's no way that you could be the best at everything in your business. There are other people out there that are going to be better than you at certain things. Let them do that. They're going to be better at it. And then you own the stuff that you're the best at and everybody's working in their love zone. That's when you can start breaking through that ceiling that we were talking about where you're capped out and you just can't do it anymore. You start breaking through that and things and we set up more process, bring in more people. And yeah, it costs more money, but you're making more money too. So it all works in the long run, but you do go through stages where it costs in order to grow. Thank you. Can you share some of your challenges of trying to build an exit ready business and how did you overcome them? Sure. I mean, almost always the biggest one is people, you know, it's finding the right people. And one of the things that um, I, as you mentioned, I'm a certified exit planner, but I'm also certified in uh, personality assessments called Colby, K-O-L-B-E. And we use Colby and I help other um, businesses use Colby to do what we call right fit hiring. And it's just an awesome assessment that lets people know how they make decisions. And when you start doing that and overlaying that, you can see it from a team perspective. You get the individual's assessment, then you look at it on how they uh, how they work. Let's say they're a bookkeeper, we're hiring a bookkeeper. Well, I'll take their assessment and map it into a bookkeeper's assessment and see if they're going to be a right fit for that particular job within our organization. And hiring the right person off the bat, or at least reducing the risk of hiring the wrong person um, is such an important thing because we've all been there. We've all hired and then gone through one or two, three weeks, or sometimes three months to find out at this wrong person. And we go back to the drawing board and start it all over again. And I think that's really demoralizing for a lot of business owners. So what we try and do is try to get the right person in off the bat so that they are culturally the right fit. They're making the decisions. They're good fit for the team so that we can get done what we need to get do off the bat. And when that happens, it's like magic happens when the, when the team comes together in that way and everybody's aligned. And when we have aligned accountability within the business, then you can move from operator to owner. You can get some freedom back. You can actually have other people making decisions for you because the process is right because the people are right and things are happening the way they should happen in order to deliver the promise to your customer which whatever that promise is uh, that you deliver in your business um, it's unique to everybody's uh, own business but ultimately we need to have this full alignment in order for it to happen thank you how do you protect your business when you are, let's say, delegating to other people that could perhaps learn what you're doing and then just set up their own company instead of continuing to work for you? Well, if I was worried about that, um, I probably would have stopped growing 25 years ago. 
And I have lost people that have gone out and started their own uh, business. And uh, I have lost people that have gone out and done other businesses that aren't my competitors. But I've had directly competing people start and learn from me. But you know what? That's part of the business journey. And um, I don't really, I do my own thing and I let them do their own thing. And I don't really worry about it too much. Uh, at the time, they were the right fit for my business and they aren't anymore. That's okay. So um, people are going to make their own decisions, Lily. And uh, at from a business owner perspective, you just need to make sure that the right people are on your team right now. And you can't worry about that kind of stuff. Thank you. What about if you are dealing with very sensitive high-end market where let's say you have a certain you know a certain um really great relationship with a lot of celebrities or you know influencers they just know you directly uh but imagine i introduced you know pedro from my team and maybe pedro doesn't have uh such great you know pr or you know uh the idea of how to manage that kind of relationship because sometimes this kind of uh high profile entrepreneurs tend to be quite you know, selective about who they spend time with or who they communicate with. Maybe they just want to communicate with you. What do you do there? Then if if you're the point of communication, you need to offload all the stuff that they don't see to somebody else. So all the things that they want done that they think you're doing personally, but you're not, you have other people do all the things underneath you so that you're not doing all of that other stuff in your job. Remember, we talked about love it or leave it. Your job then is to become the communication person with those people and everything else gets done underneath that without them knowing who's doing it. And quite honestly, they probably don't care who's doing it. They just want to know that it's being done. And so, you know, there's several different ways to align and assign accountability and authority. But the other thing is to know that, that your business if that's the, if that's the type of business your business value is based upon your relationship with those people so it's going to be a lot less sellable down the road you might make more money during the time that you own it but as far as the valuation of it goes to turn to somebody else it's going to be very hard to sell if the relationships are all with that one person. And that's why we try and inject the other people as much as we can along the way. And, you know, you could start off by having the person accompany you on many of these different meetings and stuff like that, so that there's some acquaintance and some sort of interaction there along the way to make sure that things are going okay. And then if transfer can happen, transfer happens down the road. But um, if transfer is never going to happen, then Basically, the only thing you can do to clear up your time is to have all of the uh, tasks underneath that conversation done by somebody else. Thank you. How do you protect your business from from having your clients hijacked? I mean, like, you know, hiring like a manager or multiple managers that will end up taking your entire database with them and, uh, you know, leave you with nothing. I, I work in a trusting environment, Lily, not not a not one of non-trust. So um, this is another trusting question. Um, my my belief is that if you have the right people, you can trust them, and if you don't have the right people, you can't trust them, and they shouldn't be working for you. So I share everything, including my balance sheet and my income statement, with my key managers. They know exactly how much money we make. They know exactly what we're doing in order to make the decisions that I need them to make as part of my business team. So. Um, my philosophy around that is if you've hired people that you don't trust, they shouldn't be working for you. Thank you. What systems and procedures should entrepreneurs uh, include in uh, their operating procedures to make sure that their business is a lot more sellable? Well, everything that, you know, in those five Ps, once you have your promise, and I'll use my shoe stores, for example, because it's easy. Everybody's bought shoes. So at our shoe stores, our promise to our clients is to help them look great and feel fantastic. That's our promise. When they come in the stores, we want them leaving with a pair of shoes that's going to make them look great and feel fantastic. Well, how do we know that? We know that through about nine letters, and those nine letters are ooh, ah, and aha. So we have processes in place to get those expressions out of their body. And here it is. When they put them on, when they try them on, we say, let's go to the mirror and see if you like them. They go to the mirror and they go, ooh, I look pretty good, <laughs> right? And then you say, how do they feel? Close your eyes. How do they feel? And they close their eyes and they're like, ah, those feel fantastic. And then we're like, look great, feel fantastic. That's our promise. 
And then we have an aha moment. And the aha moment is I finally found the perfect pair because most of the time, the ones that look good don't feel fantastic. And the ones that feel fantastic don't look so good. So if I found the perfect pair, I'm going to be happy with my purchase. I'm going to go to the till, pay my bill and be happy and leave and say, you know what? Shootopia is my favorite shoe store. That's a process, Lily, that we, we've created in our sales process that almost everybody on our sales floor follows. And so what's the process for you? And I'm talking to you, the listener today. What's your process to take people through from the promise, through the pr aligned product, through the process, through the people to get the profit? And that's the way we do it at Utopia, because if we couldn't deliver that promise, nobody would buy the shoes. We wouldn't make any profit. So we need to have things in a structured way, aligned and assigned to other people, not just us, that's going to make your business happen without you. And that's why I said off the bat here, I work about a day a week in my shoe stores. We have two shoe stores. And, you know, for the most part, I really don't work in them. The decisions are being made. Everything's being done without me because because we have that process in place. And now my shoe stores are more of an investment than they are my actual job. Thank you. What automation tools should entrepreneurs implement in order to make their lives easier? Well, I think everybody's favorite these days, uh, for the most part, is ChatGPT. And uh, I use ChatGPT extensively. Uh, I think it's a great tool. And, and there there are many different automations that we use. But if, you're, if your business doesn't have a CRM, a customer management um, system, you need to have a CRM. And whatever that is, in, in our retail stores, it happens to be one called Shopify that looks after everything. But it, it doesn't matter because every different industry has their own sort of preferred CRM systems. But you need to have everything in a place that's manageable and understandable. And you need to have your inventory there. You need to have all of the operational systems there. You need to have um, everything available to anybody that's making a decision in your business for you. So we use a variety of different things uh, that all kind of come together and we call it um, the Shootopia Hub. And I have another one for simplifying entrepreneurship and the Exit Ready business and the Colby Coach and all of that set of businesses that I have over there for that, you know, for my virtual assistants and all those things. But basically the idea, Lily, is that use whatever technology is good for you in your business but it's got to it's got to work out so that that technology simplifies things, makes it understandable for others, is shareable amongst your entire team, and is is puts it in a way that the items in it are actionable and executable. Thank you. How do you recommend business owners structure their company to ensure it runs smoothly without them being involved in every decision? Aside from you've just from what you've just said. Yeah, I mean, if you follow these steps, it's going to help a lot. But one of the things that's interesting is as a business owner, if if you've had your business five years, 10 years, whatever the case is, if you're still getting your team coming up to you and saying, you know, um, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about this? Or can I go ahead and do this? And you're saying to yourself, geez, that person's been with me five years. He or she should know what to do without my involvement. It's probably because you haven't actually given them authority to make that decision yet. And so so many small business owners that I see are still tied down in the in the most of this decision making, even though their team knows what to do. So my suggestion to you on those kind of um, situations is when somebody comes and asks you that question and you say, gosh, to your, you're thinking to yourself, they should know what to do. Don't answer the question because that's what they want you to do. You ask another question and the question is this, mm -hmm. what would you do if I wasn't here today? And then you just wait in uncomfortable silence until they answer. Don't don't give them the answer. Just say, what would you do if I wasn't here today? Because most often they're going to give you an answer. That's exactly right. And then you give them the authority. You now grant them the authority and say, that's exactly what you should have done if I wasn't here today. Go ahead and do it. And they've answered their own question, which you know they could. But now you've actually handed off the authority. So the next time they have that same question, they're not going to come to you anymore. And when we start alleviating all of these questions in a given day, and you're starting to hand off the authority in these different areas around your business, you're going to get be a lot more free to do the things that you either want to do, should be doing, or you know, getting yourself out of making those operational decisions and into the owner seat. Thank you. What financial metrics should entrepreneurs um, look at 
in order to make sure that the company is running without them. What I'm talking about is, for example, if um, your managers need to be always like buying, I know, inventory or certain yeah. things like that, they will need some authorization from you unless, I guess, you can pre-authorize certain things. Is that what you do? Yeah, and that is what I do. And, you know, we have what we call levels of delegation in our business. And I suggest that for everybody here, too. So it de- sort of depends on what level of delegation there is. And I'll go back to the shoe store again, because it's easy. Everybody kind of understands it. If you had to come in and return a pair of shoes and, you know, you had bought a pair of size seven and you think you need the size seven and a half. Could you imagine this situation where you went in the store with your size seven and you said, you know, I just need to return this and change it for a seven and a half. And you saw the seven and a half was there. It was you know, obvious that it was still there. And the person said, well, that's above my pay grade. I'm going to have to go get the assistant manager. So she goes, gets the assistant manager, the assistant manager comes back and she goes, oh, I, I'm i only authorized to uh, exchange size eights to nine. I can't do sevens to seven and a halves. Uh, I'm going to have to go get the manager. Now you go get the manager, the manager comes out and the manager says, oh boy, you know, um, I can authorize New Balance return or returns and exchanges, but I can't authorize Mephisto returns and exchanges. So that's going to have to wait until Peter comes in. He comes in on Wednesday mornings and this is maybe a Thursday. So uh, that's so frustrating for the customer. That's not delivering the promise. So the levels of delegation at that level our, our salesperson has the authority to make that change without any anybody talking. But if we're talking about a bigger ticket item or something like that, they might have to inject an assistant manager level decision or a store manager decision. And then ultimately, maybe even the manager or the owner of the store in my case. But like I said, I don't even hire our people anymore. So we've set up levels of delegation throughout our organization for all the different things that happen, whether it's buying up to, you know, and I, I my purchasers who buy shoes have, have an authority to buy up to $10,000 worth of, of, of shoes. So, you know, from that perspective, some of them can only buy a thousand dollars, but some of them can buy 10,000, my senior person. And so all of these things happen when we align and assign the accountabilities, we put dollars beside them that make sense. And then what I call is the owner gets to move from the detail of the organization to the dashboard of the organization. So I really don't care of the $10,000 what's being bought because we have process in place that they know what to buy, the automatic order you were talking about automations, automatic orders come in. And it's like, we need to replace all these shoes that we sold last week. Just go ahead and order them. And so these kind of things happen uh, without my involvement and have all been approved at different steps along the way so that the business runs essentially without me, Lily. Wow. Very fascinating. Tell us where entrepreneurs can reach out to you. Best way is just to go to my website. It's Pete-Moore, M-O-H-R dot com. So Pete-Moore dot com. And you'll see on, in, once you get there, all my suite of other sites, whether it's Exit Planning or Colby or Simplifying Entrepreneurship or my podcast as well, The Business Owner Breakthrough. It's all there on that site. Follow us for more interviews with world's most influential business titans, providing you with the insights to awaken to your full potential so you can get paid to be yourself, find true happiness, and manifest anything you desire. 